Thank you so much, Mary. Um, uh, you know, my name is Ken Witt. I'm an associate director for management accounting on the R&D team for the AICPA and SEMA. And one of the things that I do is sort of contribute to our efforts to uh, uh, focus on the role of the accounting profession in all things ESG related. So sometimes I say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all about ESG all the time these days because there's so much happening in this world, but uh, I do have some other things that I need to get, <laughs> get done too. So, uh, and I am not in London. Um, Jeremy is in London, but uh, I'm, I'm in our uh, Durham, North Carolina office. So, but it is my pleasure to introduce Jeremy, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Osborne, um, a CPA from Australia originally, a CGMA and an FCMA, uh, was recently appointed to the uh, uh, director of ESG role um, uh, at the AICPA in SEMA. So he's the global head of all things ESG. Uh, he began his career in, in uh, commercial management with Unilever and uh, following Unilever, he had uh, his uh, career stints included uh, EY, Accenture, the Prince's Accounting for Sustainability Project, and most recently, he was with the uh, the Value Reporting Foundation, uh, where he served as Director of Accountancy Relationships. Uh, and while he was there, uh, he worked with accounting bodies and leading accounting firms on integrated reporting and integrated thinking, and a critical part of that was uh, the development of the integrated thinking principles, which is the primary focus of, of uh, today's discussion. So uh, over to you, Jeremy. Great, thanks very much, Ken, um, and thank you, Mary, for uh, inviting us to uh, join uh, today's uh, meeting of the, the US IR community. Uh, I can see lots of, of old friends uh, and some new friends uh, in the, the, the list of folk are on the call, so uh, great to be with you. Um, as, as Ken said, um, what uh, I'm going to try and do in the, the, the time we have today is give you a bit of an overview um, of the integrated thinking principles. Um, which were launched um, on the 1st of August. Um, I think the day uh, that the Value Reporting Foundation was consolidated um, into the RFRS Foundation. Um, and I spent uh, a lot of uh, the year leading up to that, um, developing the principles, road testing them. Uh, I know lots of you have, have very generously shared your networks and shared your, your perspectives and viewpoints. And I hope uh, we've done some justice uh, to the uh, to the input that you very kindly provided. So uh, I'll share my screen in a minute. Uh, I'm also going to finish uh, when I've uh, done a bit of a, a, a lightning uh, overview uh, of the principles with uh, a bit of history, uh, with some new slides I've been developing today. And I, I quite like to see how these land with you. If they resonate and excite you, if you think that I'm completely uh, daft. Uh, but let me start with, with the serious bit, uh, which is the integrated thinking. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen if I, can, if I can remember how to. Here we go, share screen. All right. Let me... Right, is that showing up, Mary? As a, Got it. As a, yep, wonderful. Yeah, as a, in presentation mode. Great. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, so um, let me start with just an, an introduction um, to integrated thinking. So. Um, many of you, I'm sure all of you will know, because many of you have been working in this area for, for um, longer than I have, um, that integrated thinking and integrated reporting have always gone together. Um, when the original discussion paper for integrated reporting was published um, in 2012, I think it was January of 2012, um, we introduced the concept of integrated thinking. And it's something that over the years um, I have found when I've uh, worked with clients um, that they've actually understood integrated thinking much more intuitively than integrated reporting. Integrated reporting generally needs explaining. Um, integrated thinking rarely needs explaining. Um, however, um, we, we felt that um, with 10 years of experience um, uh, behind us by the time we came to draft the prototype integrated thinking principles at the Value Reporting Foundation, um, it would be helpful uh, to commit to paper uh, conceptually what we felt um, integrated thinking um, is. And um, this is really just a, a, a summary uh, of, of the concept. And the idea is that integrated thinking um, will allow you and your organisations to understand um, and improve the interdependencies between your 
your operational and functional units and resources and relationships, manage your ESG impacts, um, and ultimately enhance value creation or minimize value erosion. Uh, now that's that's quite a sort of convoluted explanation. There's there's a lot of substance um, within that. Um, I like to think of integrated th uh, integrated thinking um, as the the bedrock of sustainable value creation. It's a, and it's about helping you manage your business better. It's a it's a management approach um, in a way that helps you not just think about the the individual constituent parts of your entity. And what you do, but how everything fits together um, within um, a, a system that you, to some extent, can control. You obviously control the bits that you own and manage, but you can't necessarily control um, your broader value chain um, and supply chain. Integrated thinking is a um, a, a way of thinking which um, uh, should should help with that and provide um, stronger leadership um, and management um, around that. Um, when, when we drafted the principles, we, we didn't just want to pluck them out of thin air. We really wanted to draw on what we were hearing from the coalface of management um, practice within businesses they were doing and how integrated thinking um, was supporting them. Um, the, the, the IRLC, then the Value Reporting Foundation, now the IFRS Foundation, um, uh, has, uh, and some of you have been directly involved with this, um, has had a, a, a long-standing business network and within that there's a, 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 a an inner sanctum um, of um, organizations that um, are in many ways at the forefront of integrated thinking and um, the RFS Foundation has um, 14 or 15 case studies they're really really interesting to have a look at because um, they, they're just a simple story of how has integrated thinking helped these organizations um, uh, um, uh, understand uh, and then execute, uh, articulate and then execute um, their strategy. Um, and this is what we heard um, from them. And they're, they're, they're big companies. It's the likes of um, uh, UBS uh, in Switzerland, Yorkshire Water, Nova Nordisk, ABN Ambro. Um, so some really big names there. Um, and what they've said um, is that the benefits they've derived is that integrated thinking has helped integrate financial and sustainability performance. Um, and that will become ever more important um, as the, the um, IWSB launches um, IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 as actual standards early next year. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's going to fall to the finance team to really work through all that integration of, of financial and sustainability performance is and, and what the connections are between them. Um, it supports integrated things supports cross-functional collaboration, um, and I think that's that's another really important um, aspect. As, as as Ken said, I began my career in commercial management um, uh, in the consumer products industry, um, and I think this idea that although one may be professionally aligned um, to function, actually understanding how to work with colleagues across different functions and understanding what their worldview is and how they contribute. Um, towards value creation um, within the entity uh, uh, is an essential aspect of managing a complex organization in the, in the 2020s. It strengthens the trust uh, of your key stakeholders. And trust is something that from the Edelman Trust Barometer year after year has been amongst the top issues um, concerning those uh, that Edelman uh, interviews as part of that survey. And the loss of trust, I think particularly um, since the 2008 financial cra crash. Um, and uh, no doubt um, th this year and next year are going to be particularly testing uh, in terms of how people trust the organisations uh, that uh, govern them uh, and um, are a key part of, of, of economic production within, it, within their countries. Um, and it drives value creation through um, a better understanding, a clear articulation um, of purpose and culture. Um, so as I said, don't, don't just take my word for it. Um, have a look at the, the case studies. Um, I have got links at the end of this presentation um, that will uh, take you to the, to the appropriate um, resources, which um, hopefully we, we can share afterwards. Um, well, what does the, the IFRS Foundation say? Um, they acquired um, the integrated thinking principles uh, on the 1st of August, and that was a really exciting moment. 
um, for everybody who's been involved with integrated thinking, because suddenly um, uh, integrated thinking um, has uh, been publicly endorsed um, by the Art for S Foundation. So good at three thumbs up. So I'm quite proud uh, of, of these quotes below. Um, so two are from the website uh, and one is from a, a, a press release. Um, so the website of the IFRS Foundation says, uh, describes integrated thinking as a strategic planning tool for boards and management and practical guidance that will enhance the quality of corporate governance and reporting. Um, and underneath, um, there's this uh, great quote from the, the chair of the IASB and the chair of the IWSB. Um, saying we strongly encourage continued use of the integrated reporting framework and the integrated thinking principles uh, underpinning it. And they then go on to explain um, about how integrated thinking and underpin better um, corporate governance. Um, and from the perspective of my, my new role as, as global head of ESG um, at ALCP and SEMA, um, it's great to see this explicit endorsement of the G because the G tends to be rather silent. Um, possibly because people like me, uh, who come from a non-corporate governance background, don't always understand it terribly well. Um, but I, I think it's great to, to see integrated thinking here called out as something that supports better, stronger corporate governance and, and better reporting. Um, and I'll explain um, how and why uh, in a minute. So the integrated thinking principles um, underpin, um, uh, they're rooted in the concept uh, of uh, integrated thinking. And um, when we were working through sort of appropriate metaphors for this, and we gave a lot of thought to how to articulate integrated thinking, because it's one thing to have a good idea, but it also needs to be um, communicated in a, in a clear and, and um, inspiring way. And I, I hope that's what we've achieved uh, with the work that was done um, under the Value Reporting Foundation. But we think of the integrated thinking principles as a guiding star um, to help um, organisations on their journey towards creating and preserving value over time and minimising value erosion. Um, we were quite careful with our language here. We didn't want to lose sight of value erosion. Um, those of you with a, a BDI and a good memory will know that when the uh, uh, integrated reporting framework um, was uh, br brushed off and republished um, at the beginning of I think it was 2021, although uh, the pandemic does strange things to one's memory. Um, uh, that the the um, the concept of value creation and preservation was very carefully balanced with value erosion, um, because uh, uh, it was a concern that interest reporting, interest thinking would only be used to tell a good story rather than telling a balanced story. Um, and I think that's that must be the case as well with integrated um, thinking principles. Um, so we said to, to minimise value erosion on the assumption that most companies would not deliberately set out uh, to erode value. Um, and in this diagram, we've, we've tried to, um, to reimagine um, the, the value creation diagram from the IR framework. If, if you can recall that, it's sometimes called the octopus diagram. Um, it's quite a complex diagram. It's got lots of lines going into the business model, lots of lines coming out. Um, but we know um, from feedback that, that people have found that concept very helpful. Um, and we felt that we would um, uh, try and reduce that to its essence um, in the context of the integrated thinking principles. Now, what you have at the, the center of this uh, planet of, you might think of it as, uh, as Saturn, um, is the business model. Um, and uh, that's really important that, that that is there because the business model drives um, value creation. Uh, and without the business model, there is no value creation. Um, so we've put it right at the, um, the epicenter, the molten core um, of this planet. Um, but it, the business model, in order to, to, um, uh, to create value and avoid value erosion and preserve value, uh, needs a set of guiding principles um, to support management, support the leadership. And that's what the integrated thinking principles do. Now, the outer mantle of the uh, the planet is the capitals of the integrated reporting framework. Um, so that's the six capitals of financial, manufactured, intellectual, natural, social and relationship and human, all of which are important in the ultimate creation of economic um, value creation, which drives uh, the capital markets. The rings around the planet, the inner ring, the small inner ring is tangible value and the large outer ring is intangible value. Um, and that, of course, is reflecting 
the fact that for, for a typical modern company, um, most of its market value now is reflected, is wrapped up in its intangible value rather than uh, its tangible value. Uh, and value creation here is defined as value creation not only for the enterprise um, and its shareholders, but also for its key stakeholders, of which, of course, investors um, are one of those. Uh, and just as every planet is part of a, a, a broader solar system and a solar system sits within a universe, um, likewise, this planet is buffeted by the external environment and, and no organisation um, exists in isolation from its external environment. So we wanted to call that out explicitly. And the principles are designed to help um, particularly senior teams with better decision making, with navigating the trade-offs um, that are an inherent part of the, the messy day-to-day -day world of, of managing a business, um, the, the trade-offs between its various resources and relationships, and balancing value creation over time. So that's the balance of value creation in the short term um, and in the medium and the long term. So perhaps one thinks of this as sort of short term is the next year and the medium term is the next three years and perhaps the longer term is the next five to ten years depending on um, what industry um, your organization is in. We structured the uh, the principles on um, three levels, um, levels one, level two, level three. Um, level one, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to each of these briefly, the aim is it, with level one is to encourage leadership and management to reflect on what integrated thinking is um, and uh, how um, they could act uh, as a leadership team in an integrated manner. Um, level two uh, continues this assessment um, of integrated thinking um, uh, and uh, how prevalent it is across the organization, but perhaps at the uh, more of a management level, that's a middle management level. Um, and level three is very much the operationalization um, of integrated thinking. Um, as an organization journeys towards value creation, both for the enterprise um, and its key stakeholders. And, and these three levels are, are, are interrelated, but the idea is that one starts at level one and works down to level three. Um, so let's start, whoops, I think I've lost, here we go. So I skipped over, um, skipped over a slide. Um, so let's start with the structure. Um, of the principles. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just walk you briefly through um, levels one, levels two, um, and level three. Um, so level one, um, we gave a lot of thought um, to this uh, and we, we went out, uh, we, we had a, um, a three month um, consultation period as well, or well, not consultation, a, a feedback period um, when we explicitly um, invited feedback and we reviewed all of the feedback um, we received. We had a very strong response um, to that, which was uh, encouraging. Um, so the outline structure of, of the integrated thinking principles is um, purpose, strategy, risks and opportunities, culture, governance um, and performance. And, and as I said, with the business model sitting at the heart um, of integrated thinking um, and we've, we've used the strap line creating value today, sustaining value tomorrow. Um, a very strong echo of the, the Brundtland um, Commission report from 1987 which really was the foundation stone um, of um, the, the, the modern sustainability movement. And uh, whether one's conscious of it or not, anybody working in sustainability uh, uh, is, is really drawing on those concepts laid down uh, a generation back. Now, hopefully this structure is familiar because it's, um, it shares um, uh, some common elements, for example, with the TCFD framework, uh, which has been immensely successful. Um, when, when we were creating these, I didn't um, uh, set out to copy any framework and we went through a lot of iterations, at which point I'd completely forgotten all of these other frameworks anyway. Um, and it's really interesting that what came out from that process was something which actually is very similar um, to the TCFD um, structure, which of course is also the structure now uh, of um, uh, the uh, IWSBs uh, to um, exposure drafts. So, I think that consistency is really important because if integrated thinking um, and the em emergent sustainability accounting standards were completely different, I think management and leadership would be scratching their head and go, why are we reporting one thing, but the way we're being encouraged to manage the business is completely different. So um, I hope that that continuity and uh, well, consistency of, of approach is helpful. Um, and uh, again, the image here has been carefully chosen because we want to emphasize the connectivity um, one can't have uh, um, opportunities, for example, without a strategy. 
uh, one can't have a corporate culture without a sense of what one, one's purpose is as an organisation. It's unlikely that one's going to have a particularly strong approach to risk management without strong governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so these are all interconnected. Um, but for the purposes of, of sort of uh, lucidity, we, we felt that it was helpful to um, express them in the particular order that we have. Um, so let me just, um, uh, by way of example, um, explain uh, how each of the uh, the three levels work. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, there's a lot of detail within the principles and, and I just want to give you a sense um, uh, of how they're structured. So um, level one um, is the principles themselves. So we see a, a, um, a, a repetition of uh, the, these key ideas of purpose and strategy. Um, but underneath each of them is a question and it's not a question um, that has a simple yes, no answer. We did not want these questions to be easy um, for boards and um, executive management teams uh, to be able to respond to. We want them to be, want them to be thought provoking um, because our approach is that if we can help the board and the executive management team to think um, about integrated thinking, then they'll start thinking more deeply about how the organization is, is managed. Um, so by way of example, with um, purpose. The question that we have here, it's a very simple question, uh, but it's not so easy to answer. Um, how do we make a unique contribution to the needs of society um, and why do we exist? Um, and the key, key thing here is unique contribution. We don't just want a bland statement of purpose that could cover any other company in your industry or some sort of anodyne thing that uh, 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 about, um, about the company, but something that brings out uniqueness. So every company is unique. And why do we exist? What's our role within society? Um, I've, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, in, in Poland, it was a, a CFO conference. And the question was asked there of, would we be better if we did not exist? Um, it's quite a soul searching question to ask that, uh, but it does help, um, I think, articulate um, and draw out what is it that we bring that nobody else in the world could bring um, as an organization. I think every organization starts with that. They have something unique they can bring, a product or a service. Um, and what we're encouraging is just deeper thinking um, around that. So that, that concept, a restatement of the principle, purpose, strategy, then a, a provocative question um, uh, carries through for each of the six principles. Level two, as I said, is, is really aimed at the executive management team and the senior leadership. Uh, of an organization. Um, and now um, the questions have become statements. Um, and again, um, we phrase them as statements because we don't expect every aspect of what's here, uh, that an organization would be able to agree with it. Um, and where they may say, well, um, we would like to be able to agree with it, but we're not at the point where we can, there's work to be done. Um, then hopefully that will lead to um, an enriched approach to, to integrated thinking. So uh, again, if I, I just follow through the example of purpose. So the statement now is our organizational purpose is unique. It's clearly articulated. Um, it's brought to life in, in the interactions um, of uh, the, the various stakeholders laid out. Um, so it, it's unique and clearly articulated. So this is my point about an awful lot of corporate purposes are rather anodyne. They don't really say um, very much. Um, and I suspect um, a, a lot, lot of businesses would agree with that if they were honest uh, um, uh, and, and really were objective about the, the stated corporate purpose they have. Others are not. Um, uh, so it does very much depend. Um, but it's brought to life in the interactions of everybody. Um, I, I think that's really important that um, uh, the corporate purpose isn't just something that is dusted off and and given a, a good shining once a year in the annual report or, uh, and I have seen this is, is carved in stone at the reception. Um, it, it needs to be reflected in the way everybody interacts within an organization and going about their day-to-day -day business. Um, and a really good test here is to say, what does the leadership team and senior management believe um, how their purpose is brought to life? And does that resonate with, with more junior colleagues perhaps? Uh, the most junior colleagues uh, or your cleaners um, or your facilities management um, or your uh, office reception, those who, who are a really important part of how you, your, your business interacts with within itself and, and without. Um, so 
that's the idea of, of, of this level of assessment. And as you can see for the strategy one, um, it starts to get, um, uh, there's quite a lot of different statements for an organization to think through. Then the third level um, is about operationalizing the principles um, and, bringing, uh, and bringing them to life. So the, the, the level three is, is very much a response to uh, what we heard, which is, okay, well, we, we get the principles, we agree with them, that's fine. Um, uh, the questions are, uh, the, the statements are, are helpful, but what do we do if, if we find there's a gap? Um, what can you do to support us here? Um, so what we have, um, and I think there, there are 40 of these um, across um, the six principles, um, is a series of statements about um, the underlying business processes and critical activities that if they're properly done, um, will support embedding um, integrated thinking. And the idea is that um, if the board, if the executive management team have um, identified, I don't know, five, five or six key areas amongst the six principles that where work needs to be done, that they can then turn to level three and start working through, all right, what do we actually do in terms of, of changing some aspects of, of how we manage ourselves and how we govern ourselves? Um, so uh, th this is where we, we, we get into more detail here. Um, so uh, I, I'll just give, give one example from purpose because um, I think it's quite a good one. So um, our board routinely reviews whether our company's decision-making resource allocation are consistent with our purpose. Um, so let's say we, we have our purpose um, and um, perhaps once every quarter, um, the board asks for evidence, um, perhaps uh, a, a member of the senior management um, to present and walk them through how a particular um, investment decision, maybe it's a large capex decision, maybe it's a, a smaller opex decision, um, how um, the, the stated purpose of the organization has helped inform the decision that's been made. Perhaps there were two or three different routes, two or three different options that were on the table. Uh, one had the best financial business case. Uh, one, I don't know, had the best um, uh, business case from the perspective of um, a, a new product or service. And, and, and one um, hit the other two in terms of really um, bringing, uh, demonstrating the organization's corporate purpose. Maybe that third one won out, maybe the financial one won out. But... Uh, for the board to understand how corporate purpose is actually being considered in decision making, I think is a very good litmus test um, of whether um, the organization is really walking the talk. Now, the advantage of, of doing something like this um, is that, um, uh, that uh, if the organization wanted to um, perhaps provide some um, assurance around its integrated thinking, um, that sort of process is something that the external assurance providers could also participate in as, as observers. And they could then provide uh, um, some form of, of, of um, documentary um, assurance to external stakeholders that the integrated thinking and corporate purpose really are brought to life, uh, at least in the evidence that they saw. Um, so at level three, as I said, there, there's about 40 of these. Um, and we, we tried when we were creating them to be as systematic as possible. We avoid repetition. Um, and and um, we had some very helpful feedback on, on this um, uh, earlier. Um, so, as I said, there, there's various um, things to support you with integrated thinking. So, um, these are all hyperlinked. So, Mary, perhaps if, if we can send out these slides. Um, the integrated thinking principles, they're on the IFRS uh, website. Um, we released them in a, a prototype format. Um, uh, I think it was in December um, last year. Um, uh, we left them uh, for perusal for three months. Uh, we saw feedback during that period. Uh, they have proved very, very popular, which is brilliant. Um, I think by the when I left um, Value Reporting Foundation, which was at the end of June, they'd been downloaded about 4,000 times. Um, so there's clearly something uh, that uh, uh, has uh, tickled everybody's interest with them. Um, so they were published uh, as the principles on the, the 1st of August, along with uh, the transition to integrated thinking, a guide to getting started. It's a very practical guide. It is informed by uh, the experience uh, of those 14 organisations that form the case studies. Um, uh, so if, if you're thinking, about what do I do? Uh, I like the concept. Uh, I'd like to introduce this to my uh, executive management team. Um, uh, this, is, this is sort of the, the, the handbook. 
uh, um, to support you. Um, there's also an online integrated thinking resource hub, uh, which is really, really um, helpful. Uh, again, very practical suggestions. It gives you an idea of, for each of those 40 underlying processes, how much effort's involved, how much cost might be involved, what teams might be involved. Um, again, um, all derived from, from what we've heard. Um, the, the case studies, uh, there's 14 or 15 of them. Uh, if, you've only got 90, if you've only got 60 seconds, uh, there's a 60 second summary at the beginning. Uh, if you've got a bit longer, they all follow the same structure. Um, so once you've, you've read one, uh, you'll be able to navigate your way around the others. Um, uh, some great, great case studies. Um, and then the virtual snoop reports, which um, preceded uh, all of these uh, um, is also there. So lot, lots of resources to help you. So, um, well, that, that's integrated thinking. And I, and I just want to um, uh, run some fun slides past you and, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pause. Um, so one of the things um, that, that Ken and I and, and colleagues um, at ARCP and SEMA have been uh, thinking about recently in particular um, is the extent to which sustainability and accountancy uh, perhaps represents the next great epoch um, for the profession. Um, and I just want to, to, to share some, some thoughts with you. Um, uh, some of you know, I, I began life as a historian. Well, I wasn't born a historian, that would be silly. Uh, but I studied history at university and that's still my, my great interest. Um, and when I reflect on the history of accountancy, it strikes me there's, there's been probably five movements of significance um, within um, accountancy. Um, and, and this is Luca Tapaccioli. Um, I thought it was a, a Victorian pastiche, this painting, but it's not. It's from 1492. Uh, um, so it is contemporary uh, with uh, uh, Pacioli. Uh, he was a Francis uh, Franciscan monk um, and um, he invented double entry bookkeeping. Um, he um, switched uh, um, professions, if that's all, vocations rather, uh, and became um, a merchant in Venice in the, the late 15th century. Um, and he was the, the man who codified double entry bookkeeping and his treatise uh, was republished um, right through to the end of the 19th century. And it is the basis of um, double entry bookkeeping and therefore he's the founding father um, of accountancy. So of course, double entry bookkeeping with its credits and debits is still the backbone of accountancy. So that, that was the most important development. Um, the next one um, was uh, in 17, uh, 72, which actually is the, um, the, the decade of my, my um, DPhil thesis on the East India Company. Um, these are pots by uh, the great British uh, potter Jos Josiah Wedgwood. Um, he, uh, in the 1770s, was scratching his head as to, to try and understand why some of his um, pottery lines were profitable and some were not. Um, and ceramics and pottery um, were immensely popular um, in Britain at this time. Uh, particularly uh, because of um, the great growth um, in uh, coffee consumption, sugar consumption, tea consumption. Um, and he invented the idea of overheads accounting um, and apportioning overheads, which really lays the foundation for um, management accountancy. Um, so that, that I think is the next great um, development in the history um, of accountancy. Um, the third, um, this is a map um, of the London um, Railway, the expanding London Railway Network. Um, uh, and uh, the 1890s um, uh, was uh, a time of, 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 of um, uh, the expansion of the railway network in London. They were privately funded. There were railways going north, south, east and west. Um, and um, investors had no means of comparing the potential uh, profitability of one organization with another because they all prepared their accounts willy-nilly um, and um, uh, around about this time various uh, uh, rules were, were introduced um, which required um, all of these uh, organizations to start preparing their forecasts and, and their um, uh, um, uh, uh, prospectuses um, in a consistent manner um, and that helped lay the foundations for this idea of comparability but it was very much the, the, the need of investors at, at this time um, to be able to uh, com compare one uh, railway company as prospects with another. Um, this is a photo of, of the Great Depression. Uh, and this will ring bells uh, with uh, all our American colleagues um, because it was a response to the, um, uh, the Wall Street crash of, of 19, 
2021 and the Great Depression which followed, uh, that there needed to be standardization um, of financial statements. And that standardization hasn't really changed, um, or at least not until the launch of the IWSB. And um, to prove my point, I was doing some, some research this morning. Um, on the left, uh, you have the financial statements of the Imperial Bank of Persia um, from 1919. Um, it is one of the uh, banks that, that was the precursor to HSBC um, and was, I, I think, um, incorporated into HSBC. Uh, on the right, you have uh, HSBC's um, uh, balance sheet from 2008. I've, I've chosen that date deliberately because uh, it's the year after the great, was well, the, the, the year of the great financial crash or well, that 12 month period of 2007 to 2008. Um, and what you can see, the, the balance sheet of the Imperial Bank of Persia is at the top. Um, you've got liabilities on the left and assets on the right. Um, it's not in substance particularly different. Uh, uh, the numbers are, um, but the, 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 the structure of it is, is really no different from HSBC. So here we've got nearly a hundred years uh, between um, uh, a world war uh, a financial crash, uh, all sorts of major events. And yet how companies are reporting um, hasn't really changed. Now, some of you will know that it was this particular idea and sort of irritation in a way um, that, that led um, the then Prince of Wales, uh, now King Charles III, uh, to uh, convene uh, a meeting at St. James's Palace, which led to the formation of the Integration Reporting uh, Council, the IRRC, uh, and um, I think uh, what that has done in the intervening periods is challenge um, how companies report and whether this, this system of reporting that is essentially um, dates back to the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century is really fit for purpose in the 21st century. Um, and I think um, with the launch of the RSSB uh, and uh, um, the, the future that heralds for the interest reporting framework and as a point of connectivity between financial and sustainability uh, and, and also as a vehicle for multi-capital reporting. Um, I, I think the future looks, uh, looks more confident. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, my last slide, uh, is to infinity and beyond. Um, so the, the 2020s uh, and beyond, and I really just raised the question of whether sustainability and accountancy is the next um, great um, uh, change that there'll be. Um, for what we understand accountancy to be. I think accountancy as we know it um, has been around in one form or another for the best part of, uh, of more than 500 years. Um, as, a, as a system of accounting for stuff, um, it's proved remarkably resilient. I don't know if there are any other frameworks which have um, uh, lasted uh, um, uh, quite, quite such a long time. Um, and it's proved itself, as, as we've seen with these sort of key changes there have been over the centuries, it's proved itself extremely resilient and adaptable when um, uh, businesses and um, regulators and, and others have scratched their heads and gone, there's something that's not quite right here. My, my pottery lines are not profitable in the way I thought they were. Um, I, I don't know whether to invest in the Great Northeastern Railway or the Great Western Railway. Um, we must have standardization because uh, that might have, have um, headed off the, um, the, the crash of, of uh, 1921. Uh, would that have headed off the crash of 2008? Um, who knows? Um, but is sustainability and accountancy the next great um, change uh, that, that there'll be? And, and uh, for those of us working for institutes um, and institutes of institutes such as IFAC, I know Stathis is on the call, uh, and those working in business, is our sort of responsibility at, at this stage to recognize that um, and really um, uh, sort of fly the banner for it. Um, uh, and I think the, the IWSB and those two draft standards, IFRS S1, IFRS S2, um, uh, for me anyway, really do herald something very significantly different. And for me, what that is, is the bringing together of sustainability and accountancy and the connections that now need to be made between them. And I think integrated thinking uh, can help uh, underpin that. Um, but Mary, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there on this uplifting image of, of Buzz Lightyear. Uh, I'm sure like many, I, I, I wish I could fly like him. Uh, 